I am here with Christopher Warnock, and this is the first interview I'm doing on Hacking Fate. So I'll go ahead and let uh, Chris introduce himself. Uh, he is my my mentor in traditional astrology. I've studied with a lot of people, but I really consider him my primary master, and I'll let him take it away. Oh, thanks a lot. It's really great to be here. Um, I um, first started getting interested in astrology probably, oh gosh, it's like 1998, 1997. And, you know, I, I, I looked at the modern, I sort of read some books and I'm like, I don't know if this is it. And then I discovered traditional. I was like, then I was, that was, that was really amazing. So I studied with um, Lee Lehman, did Horary, and that was really my, where I got my foundation. Um, and she's in that, in Olivia Barkley, that QHP lineage. So I'm part of that lineage. Then I started getting interested in electional and that's what we'll be talking about today. And then, uh, cause electional is kind of like the sister of horary. And then when I did electional, I started getting interested in astrological magic. So that's kind of one of my big specialties and that's kind of taken off. So, um, you know, I, um, my main, my website is renaissanceastrology.com. So there's tons of resources on that. You can take a look at that. I do lots of horror. -y. I do a good amount of electional. And then of course I'm doing astrological magic uh, as well. So I've had a lot of practical experience uh, in those different areas. So it's really going to be interesting, I think today to delve into that. And people can find you in the Spiritus Mundi group. Yeah, exactly. So, and they can find that on your website. So if you poke around Renaissance Astrology, I you can dig up the Spiritus Mundi or also you're in the Stellar Sorcerer group on Facebook too. Yeah, so I, I need to do a better find job. I, re, I just relaunched the Spiritus Mundi because it was on Yahoo. And of course, Yahoo killed everything. So I've got it on, on another, another uh, groups.io. And I need to go back and do it. Of course, I don't want to do that thing where you go to someone's website and the, what, the newsletter thing pops up at you, which I find very irritating. So, but I need to find a kind of a, something in between having to dig for it and having it shoved in your face. So I'll work on that as far as making that more accessible for people. Cool. So we're going to be discussing electional and we're focusing that discussion around John Gadbury's Nauticum Astrologicum, um, hooray Latin. So who is John Gadbury? So John Gadbury is one of those uh, English astrologers from the 17th century. And we have an incredible um, sort of uh, amount of, of work that was done in the 17th century. And that's really when you talk about traditional astrology or we talk about medieval Renaissance, really what we're talking about is the work of these astrologers who really epitomized by William Lilly, who was definitely the leading astrologer of the time. Uh, but Gadbury was one of the other semi-famous astrologers. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about he got it, how he got into some trouble. And the key event basically for this time period is the English Civil War. And um, the, one of the things that's interesting about astrology is that astrology, um, you know, just to, just to the, trace it back, you know, it arose in Babylonia and Chaldea, right? It passes into the great cultural sphere of Rome, basically, um, which is, controls the entire Mediterranean, first into Greece and then into Rome. And it flourishes. I mean, there's a tremendous interest in astrology. There's a lot of astrologers, but it dies out when the Roman Empire falls, falls in the West because you need a high level of mathematical you know, skill to be able to do it. Passes to Byzantium, and then it goes to the advanced um, Islamic civilization of the Middle East where it mixes with uh, the Hellenistic astrology, the, the Greek and Roman astrology mixes with Vedic astrology of India and then the Persian astrology in a new synthesis uh, that we might call Arabic astrology. Um, and that's like uh, 800s, 900s, figures like Abu Mashar, Mashallah. And that's really the astrology that is practiced in medieval and Renaissance Europe and then early modern Europe. And so if you look at the back of Christian astrology and you look at the sources, it's a, almost 100% coming from those Arabic sources. So it's one of those paradoxes that what they, they started doing is saying, oh, we need to get rid of the Arabic accretions and back to Ptolemy when not realizing that basically 100% of what they were doing was this, this new Arabic astrology, which is very different from Hellenistic. It's a different school. So when the, when the knowledge started to filter back into the Middle Ages as the technology and the culture started to get more sophisticated, um, it was heavily uh, dominated by clerics. And you know, you've got this huge clerical establishment not just priests, but you've got lector, all sorts of sort of hangers on and clerks and people like that that are literate in Latin and knowledgeable, 
but maybe not don't have that much to do. And so they even cut this, what they call the clerical underworld that started doing magic and spells and things like that. But astrology was big with them. And what's interesting is, um, you know, again, if you look at astrology in England, it's very much being done by clerics and priests and people like that until we start getting to this early modern period. And, you know, so Lily and people like Gadbury, these are uh, lay people. These are people that they're, they have Latin. You can tell if you look at Christian astrology, they have a certain amount of knowledge of Latin, but they're not, you know, someone who's a scholar or someone who's a, a priest or something like that. Now, partly with the Reformation, with the breaking of the, of the, of Christendom into Protestant and Catholic, you have a lot more think lay people. There's also much more of a desire, for example, to have the Bible in English. Um, and so, um, but if you look at what the astrology that Lily's doing, a lot of it, and these other astrologers are coming from Bonatti. If you look at Bonatti's Liber Astronomia, that's an absolutely key source. And you can tell, for example, you look at the seventh house in Christian astrology, right? And it's almost word for word coming out of Bonatti. But so obviously Bonatti's a huge influence. But what, what these guys are doing is producing a, um, this science, this art um, in English. And so they're publishing in English. Um, and there's a, and they're doing more and more of that. Now, one of the interesting things about the English Civil War is that previous to that, the stationers company, which was a guild, uh, uh, did censorship. So you couldn't just publish whatever you wanted to. You had to get it signed off. And um, John Booker was basically the one who did all the astrological books, and he would actually censor them and make sure that they were acceptable. So one of the things that happened with the English Civil War is the censorship disappeared as the government you know, basically fragmented. And so we have a huge explosion of people publishing stuff. So you have people that are interested in the stuff, but aren't necessarily the, the elite that, you know, are totally literate in Latin. Uh, people reading in English are semi-literate in, 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 in Latin. And then you have this explosion of, of source text. So it's interesting if you look at uh, astrology in English, we have a huge number of things right around the middle of the 17th century. And then as the, and after the restoration, after the English Civil War is over and they get the king back, then sort of censorship kind of comes back, but also people get more skeptical about it, which we'll talk more as, as we go through that. So the, this, this, this period, this mid-range period in the 17th um, century, 1640, 1650, 1660, is an incredible period of ferment of ideas and change and knowledge and upheaval. You can see it in astrology, but it, it's throughout, the, throughout England and, and due to the English Civil War. Um, and so Lily obviously plays a big role in that, and Gadbury inter in, is intertwined with that role. So let me pass it off to you, and you can talk a little bit about the interaction, you know, of Gadbury and Lily and the and the uh, and the political stuff. Cool. Yeah, I can I can do a little bit of that. Um, so my understanding is that Gadbury met Lily, and Lily encouraged him to study astrology. And at the time, Gadbury was kind of a 17th century hippie. He was um, involved in um, the family of love and the levelers. So it was free love and also being very democratic as far as wanting everybody to uh, really be able to have access to everything. Um, and then uh, Gadbury went off and started studying astrology and became a royalist which didn't end up working very well with Lily, who was still very much about the astrology for all the peoples and um, rule for all the peoples. And well, let me, so- Let me jump with, in there. It's, yeah, That's please. a little more complicated than that. Because what you have is <laughs> yeah. in the English Civil War, what you essentially have is that the, um, the Stuarts, you know, uh, the last uh, Tudor queen was Elizabeth, right? And when she died, then um, James VI and I of Scotland became king and um and he's the first king of the Stuart dynasty now he was protestant but um his son charles started moving towards i'm not sure if he was a catholic but they started moving in the direction of being open to catholics his queen was catholic henrietta maria and so they became more and more open to that but also being more autocratic so more like the the kings which so they got basically into a power struggle between the king and parliament so but parliament was not democratic parliament was made up of the lords and then also the, you know, more well-to-do, um, the more powerful elite, um, you know, gentry sort of person or nobles and wealthy merchants. Um, so that was a power struggle between parliament and the king. 
And so Lily was definitely a parliamentarian. He was, a, and, and they said that Lily's um, was as good as two regiments for the parliamentary cause because he would keep doing, you know, prophecies and he would do predictions and stuff. And it was generally trying to, you know, favor the parliamentarians. Um, and so he and Gadbury got on opposite sides. So, um, and, and so you, it's, it's sort of like reminds me of something like Whitaker Chambers or those communists, they'll go in and they'll change from being a communist into being super right wing. So that's kind of, or less somebody like, um, you know, you're a hippie and turn into a stockbroker type. Um, and um, so um, that's kind of what happened with Gadbury. So he became a royalist. The problem with that was that, so as the time, so it starts out is that you got parliamentarian versus royalists. So you go with the royalists and that was problematic because then the parliamentarians took over. And then, um, then when the restoration, all the royalists are back up again. Then the problem with that was that the Whigs, who are again sort of the resurgence of the the powerful elite, they basically come in and 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 James was the brother of, of Charles II, and he was a, he was Catholic, um, and he got deposed in favor of William and Mary. So they they basically imposed a political settlement where the rich sort of landowners and elites basically again took over and um, made sure that the king wasn't a complete autocrat. So at that point, Gadbury was kind of out. Because by being a royalist, he was he was again supporting that extreme, more autocratic, um, you know. So he kind of his real ups and downs. Lily got smart and sort of shut up. I mean, he was very active in favor of Parliament, and then he just really basically kept his mouth shut. And he was actually after the Restoration was called up in front of Parliament, and you know was examined on it. And that's that whole story about the burning of London, whether he predicted it or not. He was actually asked about that, and he's like, "Well, it's like not really." And and his prediction was not astrological but prophetic. And so in one of his books, there's a picture of two uh, look like twins upside down over a fire. And so Gemini is supposed to be London. So that's supposed to predict the great fire. Of course, there's no date. It was not astrological. So whether or not that's a really a prediction of the great fire of London is, I mean, it, a fire in London, maybe, but even then it's a little bit shaky. But um, so that's a little bit, I mean, the politics of that are very complicated, but what, what it doesn't surprise me is that they got at each other's throat because astrologers, whether now or then, do seem to be, don't seem to be able to get along very well. So they, they sort of, uh, they got into a lot of this sort of uh, slow flame wars, you know, instead of having Twitter where they can put it out instantly, they had to wait six months until they could print it up, but they would do these pamphlets or their almanacs or whatever, and they would be pretty viciously attacking each other back and forth. I think partly because they got mad at each other and partly because it was a good way to get publicity and kind of build yourself up by tearing the other person down. And um, they, they would get into political stuff too. Like I said, Lily was parliamentarian and then Gadbury got in with Wharton who was a Catholic. And of course the Catholics were supporting the King. Um, so that was just sort of a natural political um, uh, situation that they got into with going after each other. So the combination of politics and then astrological um, you know, fighting and they had some pretty vicious uh, uh, flame wars. Well, and also after he kind of established himself, Gadbury was trying to push the whole using the the scientific method and pushing astrology more as a science, um, and that that also resulted in in a bit of trouble. But it also gave rise to the way that he wrote the um, uh, wrote this work the uh, Nautica Astrologicum, where he's using the examples and he's really trying to go at it in an exper experimental way where he takes a lot of detailed notes about what the outcome should be and why it is and why it isn't. So I, 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 th I think yeah. he's, it's similar to what Lily does, though. I, I wouldn't want to really want to majorly differentiate because I think one of the things that's really interesting about Christian astrology is that Lily has so many examples, you know, and that's something unusual. I mean, uh, cause you do see examples like Abu Mashar will have some examples and Banati had a few, but not to the same level that Lily did. And also Lily was very clear about, okay, this is what I do versus maybe, you know, he would give the tradition, right? But he would also say, okay, this is my methodology and this is what I do. So I, I think that's part of this whole ferment that these guys were taking it very seriously and that they were also, um, you know, doing more than just, you know, passing along what they learned previously, but actually doing it and, and giving, but I think that's, what's really amazing about, what I would say is very interesting about Nautica Astrologicum is this, is a, this is a book about ships, right? 
And so it seems like it'd be super highly technical and something that wouldn't be of much interest to us. But what, what Gadbury does in this is this is the only example that I'm aware of in a traditional source, definitely in a Renaissance or early modern source, but I don't even think I've seen much else in, in you know, other even Hellenistic or medieval sources that gives you examples of elections and then how the methodology that goes along with it. Um, and so what he does is to say, okay, there's three ways of doing elections. You can start with a natal chart, you can start with a horary, or you can just try to get a good election. And it's interesting because you, you will see a lot in traditional sources where they'll say, oh, you have to do it. To do an election, you have to use a natal chart, have to use a natal chart. And then they don't give you any idea how to do it. Absolutely no methodology whatsoever. And then they certainly don't give you examples. So that's why I would say that Nautica Mastrologicum is just, it's like rubies. It's so precious because it's actually giving us an example that we can then take a look at. And I think that that's really quite amazing. So this is a, it was a great choice to talk about you know, and to launch off talking about electional astrology. Um, so, and I'll, then I'll hand it back to you. <laughs> well, yeah, let me, let me dive into, um, I, I think it's always fun to read the full titles of these works because they're really obnoxious and super long, but also very interesting. And the full title of this one is Nauticum Astrologicum, or the Astrological Seaman, Directing Merchants, Captains of Ships, Mariners, Insurers, etc., how, by God's blessing, they may escape diverse dangers which commonly happen in the ocean, unto which is added a diary of the weather for 21 years together, exactly observed in London, with sundry observations thereon. So that's that's a lot of fun. And it, it also kind of gives you an idea of what he's going for here because it's for the the seamen and the captains and the insurers. So he definitely has the the whole business side in mind, as well as the management side, as well as the working side. And I think that comes through in some of the the electional information he gives. Yeah, well it's it's interesting because it fits in with the sort of early development of Lloyd's of London, which I think people have sort of heard of, but are not particularly clear on it. It's like, oh, it's an insurance company. It's like, it's actually not an ins exactly an insurance company. It is um, basically a set of sort of partnerships. And so you, you, you would invest, it's, you know, you invest in a, um, you know, in a particular lines of type types of insurance. And so um, this is early, very early capitalism, really. I mean, without insurance, they weren't able to do the ship, you know, they couldn't have the, sh the, the ships uh, and the shipping. So it's, and in London, of course, is a real center for this. Um, and this is sort of the, and obviously if you're an insurer, it'd be interesting to know whether the ship was going to, you know, was going to, um, when to launch and, you know, whether it was going to make the voyage or not for a horary. Um, so, I, but I think it, you're right. I think he's definitely, you know, it's a, an excellent marketing move on his part to go ahead and, and put it that way. And ships have really interesting, I mean, Lily starts on Christian astrology and has a whole horary section on ships. And so, and if you look at the first house under Christian astrology, there's a lot of information about how to do horaries for ships, you know, and which is, you know, something that we don't do now. It's so it's not as important, obviously much bigger part of the economy uh, in the, in the 17th century. And then obviously in the 18th and 19th century as well. Well, yeah. And, and that kind of leads us into the whole chapter two of the work, which is the one that really piles in the, how do elections work and what's the methodology behind them. And he starts out with, hey, here's the geniture of a ship <laughs> and kind of discussing where you would get the natal chart of a ship from. Yeah, the launch, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, so, that's, you know, and it's interesting because, I mean, this raises another, an interesting point about elections in general, which is that because people will often come to me and say, you know, I'm, I'm doing a business and I want to do the start of the business. And so... And they'll get really obsessed with what's the birth of the business as if there's one event that's the beginning of it. Now, and I think that comes from your own birth because when you're born, that's pretty much, okay, you're born. So that's it. And, um, you know, even with that though, you know, there's a lot of like conception, isn't that a beginning too? Now, the problem with that is you don't know exactly when that takes place, but obviously that conception is a pretty important event too. So really when you're talking about an election, it's really doesn't make a lot of sense to argue about try to find what you think the most important event is because there's lots of different possible start points that can be elected, you know, and really what it comes down to is a question, I think of practicality. 
you know, and cost benefit, because if something's really important, I like to elect it, you know, um, but it may not be possible. I mean, in order to do an election, it has to be under your control. I mean, there's no point in having a really elaborate time, date and place to do something if it's something you can't control. Now, people, when I could actually, I can't do any legal related stuff now, but people would occasionally have like a hearing. I'm like, you can't control that. There's no way you're going to be able to call up the judge and say, okay, I want to have the hearing at, at three o'clock in the morning on Tuesday. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Um, and um, so it needs to be something under your control to even do it at, at all. The other thing I'd say about an election is just, just to be clear about what an election is, comes from the Latin alexio, which means a choice. And nowadays in English, we use election just for a political choice. But it, 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 as you can see, if you look at the early the 17th century English election re retains its older idea of a, cho a choice. So it's a choosing of things. And an election is a time range. So it needs a start and a stop time on a specific date uh, at a specific location. And so that's what you need. And sometimes I'll see elections like, well, students will give me like a, a you know, five, 505. I'm like, you need a time range because you're going to be doing something, right? You want to do it during that particular time range. And, you know, you can't do it instantaneously. Um, so, um, so I think that, the, and that's one thing I'd like to say about elections is that the practicality of elections is really key. It's like, you need to be able to have something you can control. And then also, and this is just true of any election, you can't get a perfect election. And that's something that people quickly, when you start doing it yourself, you recognize that it's impossible to have 100% everything that you want in the chart. Um, and that's just the reality of it. You know, you're looking at, you know, typically when I have a client come to me, they're saying, look at me, look at for me the next 30 or 60 days. Maybe sometimes I'll look at a year, right? But if I go to them and say, yeah, there's a great election coming up in, in 50 years, that doesn't do them any good, you know? And so it, you also, oftentimes you're in a situation where you have to do it at specific times. Like if you're talking about a, a you know, um, you know, maybe with a, a business, you need to go in during business hours. So it needs to be nine to five, Monday through Friday. That really cuts down what you're doing. So really, when you look at, at elections, there's always a trade-off. You're never going to be able to have it perfect. You're never going to have every single factor you want nor eliminate every factor that you don't want. So you need to have us, if you're going to actually do the election, you need to be practical about it because you're, you're just dealing with these limitations. So what you do is do the best you can under the circumstances. And I think that's really the key to elections. And it can be a little hard for customers and clients to understand that because typically if someone wants to get an election, there's somebody that knows a little bit about astrology. And of course, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And they know natal astrology. So they're coming at the chart, looking at it in a different way than you would as an election, more typically. As you're going to see, as we look at these, they're looking at specific factors. They're not looking at the entire chart. Um, and also people that get elections, are con they're convinced that it's really important. And if you get it right, it'll 100% work. And if you get it, if there's anything wrong with the chart, it'll your head will explode. And these are problematic too, because again, you want to get the best that you can. I mean, there's a lot of really terrible times out there that you can avoid. Um, and maybe you're just going to do that as opposed to having the, the best election of the century, which is again, not going to happen for another 75 years. So these are all things that need to be kept in, in perspective. And so there's a, there's a, a different, you know, when you're, a, when you're actually trying to get an election, you'll see it. You'll, you'll say, I'm trying to get these three things in the, in the chart. And you like pull your hair out, just trying to get those three things. Whereas the customer is like, oh, you know, Pluto's in the third house. I don't like that. I'm like, well, Pluto has to be somewhere. You can't just eliminate Pluto from the chart. And you certainly can't get rid of all the negative chart factors because every chart is a slice of reality. And reality is going to include both positive and negative at any one time. And you can do the best you can, but you're never going to eliminate it entirely. So it's, and it's very easy to look at someone else's election and go, oh, I don't like it. It sucks. What I used to do in my, my, in my discussion group was say, you can't criticize someone's election, but you can offer your own. And invariably, they would offer an election that was worse than the one that they were looking at. So that's just one of those things about elections. So let's go ahead and dive into Gadbury. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, and that, so the, the first one he offers is a ship first launched after her being built. And this and is the... This is the one with the 20 Leo, 22 Leo rising. Uh, yeah, the 20, I have 23 Leo rising, yeah, but yes, right. 22, 22 yeah. Leo rising sounds about Close right. Enough. That's one of the things that you'll notice with these charts for Gadbury is they're a little, when you look at our software, it's a little bit approximate. It's like within a couple degrees. So we're going to, we're not going to get too, too, too bent out of shape about it. So 
Rule of the first is the sun. Sun is in Pisces in the eighth. So it's peregrine, not particularly afflicted. Otherwise, it's not really afflicted. Not in great shape, but not in terrible shape either. And the first house is okay. I mean, it's it's not the most amazing chart I've ever seen, but it's not a disastrous chart either for you know for a ship. Um, well, yeah, and and this is this is basically the birth chart of the ship, right? Because right. he's he's comparing he's using this as an example of of how that works. So it kind of sets the tone for hey, the ship will be having these kinds of things. Yeah, let me just pull um, something out here. I was gonna say okay. Like, take a look at i was looking for the ship rules is generally the sign ascending and the moon are significant to the ships and what goods are her and the lord of the ascendant and those that sail in her okay yeah and it's got a bunch of stuff as far as the signs and everything but there's a lot of yeah so basically i mean there's a lot more detail to it but basically when you're looking at a ship you're looking at the what you'd expect the the first house is the ship you know just like the first house of the you know the, it's your body right or your name and so the first house and the the first house, really the first house and the moon are the main significators of the ship. And so they're not so bad in this chart. They're, no, they're not I, strong, the, but they're not afflicted either. So, I mean, I wouldn't look the, at this chart and say this is a disastrous chart for a, a ship. No, you have the part of fortune in the first house, and then the the moon is right on the cusp of the ninth house, which is appropriate for a ship. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, it's the fine. eighth house is not super great, but whatever. Yeah. I mean, you could go through and all the sorts of stuff and be like, I don't like it, but it's like, I don't think it's the disastrous chart. I mean, I don't know if I'd necessarily choose it for a chart, but you know what I mean? It's, it's not, it's not a problem. So um, what Gadbury does is to say, cause he follows this, this normal view of like, or the first one of saying, okay, you know, you they say, oh, you have to look at the natal chart. You can't do an election without doing a natal chart. And um, you know, that's, really does resonate with modern people, but for a different reason, because basically when people do what they call astrology, it's modern astrology. And if they're doing modern astrology, then they're doing natal astrology. And so it's a bit like having a toolkit and you open your toolkit up and all you have in your toolkit is a hammer. So if all you've got is natal astrology, you use it for everything. And um, so it makes sense to people that obviously everything else in, the, in astrology is based on natal astrology because that's all they're aware of. Um, so anything you want to do, you would obviously use natal. So that's not quite the same thing as where Gadbury's coming from, because he's like, you know, the natal chart is sort of your basic fate, right? And then he's, he's saying, you know, you want to base it on your, your natal chart as your basic fate. Um, whereas I think moderns are sort of like, well, the whole world revolves around me anyway. So it makes sense to have the natal chart, you know, everything revolves around my natal chart. Um, so, um, what he does is a sort of a sinistry. Is that, isn't that how you kind of describe the, the methodology? Yeah, I, I would definitely describe it as, as a kind of sinistry. So what, what he says is to do a natal-based election, what you want to do is have the in the election, you want to have the rising sign, either the same sign as the rising sign in the, in the nativity, which is the natal chart, or trine or sextile to that sign. Okay. Alternatively, if you can't do that, you use the sign that the benefics, the, the, that's the greater benefic is Jupiter and lesser benefic is Venus, what sign they're in, or the sun or the moon, and use those as the rising sign in the election. And so that's what he tells us to use as the rules, right? And then he kind of, he also says, make sure the moon is well-placed um, and is in a conjunction, sextile or trine, um, and good, you know, good, making good sex uh, aspects. And then the, um, also to look to the natal lord of the, the ninth and the ascendant what their, their, their places um and um or, or conjunction section out trying the lord of the, of the ninth or the ascendant um so those are the rules he gives us and then when he does the example he throws in other stuff and so well, he's basically that's how they all work yeah he's basically saying okay so you've got in the natal chart you have certain points and these are sort of sensitive points that are positive right and so the the, the signs of you know, and that's, you look at those signs and then you want to put those signs into your election if you can. You want to, so for example, if you had, you know, let me take a look at this chart here. So the, in the, um, in the, in the chart of the, um, so the second chart is then um, this Gemini rising, right? Yes. Okay. Gemini rising. And that is, let me see, let me go back to my 
thing that's so he says okay okay so he says gemini ascend which was the 11th house of the nativity well he didn't say anything about that so they just throw that in as new okay that's yeah. new so um and then, um, which I don't disagree with. I mean, 11th house is fine. Um, it says the Lord of the Ascendant is on the place of the moon. And Jupiter here is sextile to his radical place. So, you know, as I look at this, I'm like, not that I disagree with any of this stuff, but it's like, it does give me a little bit of a flavor of making it up as you go along. Because he didn't say that to start with, you know. And it, it seems like you'd have an almost infinite number of places that you could do it to. You know what I mean? If you're, if you're talking about, because he, he didn't say anything about doing it to your, the radical place. So you're saying, okay, Jupiter is to his own place. Well, we didn't even talk about Jupiter in the previous thing. So I'm just a little skeptical of this as a practical method, just from that standpoint, is that when I typically do something, you know, you're used to this as a student, is like, I'll say, these are the five things that you need to do, Right. And these are the things that you don't want to have, right? And you don't, I don't give you an example where I vary that around and say, oh yeah, here's a third thing. I mean, I can see the logic of what he's doing, right? Because the logic is based off of, like I said, there's certain signs. These are positive signs because they're, they're of the places of the benefics or, the, or they're the sign on a particular house that's a positive house. And therefore that's good to put stuff in that sign, right? But it's, it seems almost unlimited in terms of the, how you could do it. Now, the other flip side of that is negative stuff, which he doesn't talk about. It's like, what about the signs that the malefics are in? What about the sign on the eighth, right? And you could, again, by not having any limitation on those rules, you could go back and say, oh my God, you got the eighth sign is now the, you know, ascendant, right? We don't want to have that. So that's what I would say about this. And the, the whole concept of using natal uh, uh, factors in general, again, I'm an outlier because everybody that you talk to, whether it's a modern person or whether you, or it's a traditional source, if you ask them, they're going to say, oh no, you have to use that. You got to do it. And then they always have their own way, you know, whether they actually have a way of implementing that can't tell, or they have their own way of doing it. What I say is I'm going to be fine. We'll see this later is Gadbury's third method. I don't worry about it because it's too complicated. That's the problem. If you're trying to get a good election with good factors in it, right? and you're trying to get these natal factors in it, you, you'll just start pulling your hair out. And you can do a little bit of it. You know, you could, you could pick up maybe Ascendant or a couple of them, right? But you're really going to have to put a very quick limitation on how many of these factors you try to put in the chart or how many factors you try to avoid, because otherwise you're going to go nuts. I mean, it's very difficult to control more than about four or five factors in the chart. So, but that's what I would say. So the essence of what his methodology is to look at the natal chart see the signs of, like I said, the ascendant, the benefics, the moon, the sun, and then also trine and sextile to those. And then those are the ones that you want to concentrate on in your election. And that's going to, that's, that's what he, Gadbury says, this is going to give you a better election. So um, interesting, very interesting. I mean, he, he does do a decent job of throwing the moon into the rising sign of the the genitature chart needle chart of the the ship um but and you can then see what i'm saying yeah. about no no you're opposite. right you're totally right he just, <laughs> just starts wigging you know wigging out oh yeah that's all the over the place house, you know i'm like okay fine you know and um uh, yeah I, and i honestly i i do a little bit of that too and that's one of the things that you have to correct me on is um on occasion i will go out of my way to justify something that doesn't fit the the primary factors because of of bad habits that I've gotten into in the past would be I can justify anything if I just try and that that doesn't really work out very well uh, in any way. One of the things that's you know and, and this is interesting because you know there were teachers of horror, right? And that's that like I said that's that QHP that that Olivia Barclay lineage. And also if you look at Christian astrology, there's a ton of examples, right? And Lily does a really good job of ex have giving you a lot of rules, giving you a lot of methodologies, and then giving you some, some examples to work with, right? And the nice thing about horror is that you get the feedback, right? You, you do it, you do the question, you do the analysis, and then, you know, oftentimes, you, you know, I don't know, 10, 20% of the time, I'll get people come back to me and say, here's what happened. So by now, I've got a couple hundred charts in terms of, you know, what the results are, and Lily gives that too. So we have a lot of feedback, 
right? We have a lot of, of ability to look at the chart, see what the rules are and see what, how they did it. Electional, we don't have that. You know, like I said, Gadbury is just about it in terms of any election examples at all, you know? And so what, what the problem is that I, I think with electional is that, and I see this with the a, a contemporary and whether they're modern or traditional, is there's really a tendency to just start looking at charts first. The first thing you do is start looking at charts and then these various factors sort of pop out at you, right? And you're like, oh yeah, look at that. There's blah, blah, blah. And either it's positive or negative. You're like, oh shit, look, there's this problem here with this or, oh, I like this or don't like that. And that's your starting point is just flipping through charts and sort of randomly factors. Now I'll look at that and say, yeah, sure. I agree that, you know, trines Jupiter. I mean, I can see where you're coming from. But that's not a methodology. And what I do, and like I said, I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but this is what I found worked the best, was to say, okay, let's decide what factors are absolutely vital, right? And that have to be in the chart and what factors absolutely cannot be in the chart. And then let's focus on that. And the, it's, it's fine to have additional stuff, right? But let's look at those as a bonus right? And not get carried away with those as the, as the focus of the chart. So like I said, if I'm looking at the ship chart, the key really that, you know, that, that, that they start off with is saying, okay, first house and the moon, right? And the rule of the first. So we want to look at those and make sure that those are well-placed and unafflicted, you know, and that's probably what I would be looking at in terms of, uh, you know, or the, and the ninth, because the ninth is journeys, right? And so those probably what those are the those are the areas that I'd be looking at, and I wouldn't be worrying about the place of Jupiter into his radical place, you know, whatever. And because um, I think you lose your focus with that, you know, you get into doing all this extraneous stuff, and you lose your focus on what's really vital to the election. Um, and and then there's no continuity to it, you know. One election doesn't have anything to do with another election. They're all just kind of happenstance, and you don't have a method. I mean, they have a methodology, but the methodology is just kind of being a little bit random you know, and um, whereas I prefer to have, like I said, these set factors and follow those. Um, and um, so, um, yeah, well, let me go back to you. Did you have more comments about the natal chart or natal so, stuff? So, no, not really. Um, I mean, I can, I can see where he kind of, where he was kind of following what he was saying, but then he, and this seems to be one of the issues that uh, reading the the older text, this comes up again and again and again. They'll like mention, okay, here are a handful of things that we like. And then they won't mention how that plays in, in the chart examples themselves. And they'll go off on tangents, which is kind of what he did in this example here too. But I mean, if, if you look at it, um, you have the relationship uh, with the elected time where he does uh, set up the relationship with the um, the ruler of the natal ninth, it's specifically mentioned because that's trining, um, that's trining Mars and you have the moon trining Mars. And then you also have the moon, um, trining Venus, which is in Aries, which is the ninth. And so he, he, he's kind of following that, but as far as clearly explaining what he's doing, I don't think he's doing a great job um, in the way that the work's laid out itself. I would say, I don't think he's really serious about those factors because he doesn't really have a methodology, you know, it ought to be, because, you know, for example, if you think about Lily, right. In, in the natal and when he does his violent death stuff, have you done that before that section before I've played a, I've played with that. Yes. Okay. I, I have done Lily, that section he before. He goes through and he's got this mm -hmm. incredible, you know, all these rules, Detail. right? <laughs> yes. It's like logic games, like if then, you know, Boolean almost, you know what I mean? So it's oh, exactly. possible to do that, <laughs> right? It's And you go mm -hmm. through that and you'd be like, you know what? You don't, it doesn't, it doesn't fit the, the, the violent, you know what I mean? It's like five different things. Like, you know what I mean? You go through two pages of it, right? And you're like, hey, it's not violent death, not indicated in the chart, or it is, right? You can see the thing. Yes. <laughs> so it's very, that's probably, I think that's probably overkill, right? But I like that a lot. <laughs> I know it's fun. Well, my we like it. We like all the bullying <laughs> stuff. But I mean, it's it's not impossible, right? Whereas what what Gadbury's doing is sort of briefly sketching out some possibilities. And I think if you were going to do it for elections, what you need to do is to come in and be more rigorous about it. And what you would do is to say, okay, that for example, like the using you want to have the right, you want to have the sign on the tenth. Like, for example, like you'd look and say, okay, I only, all I'm going to look at is the first, the 10th, and the 9th, right? 
And mm-hmm. my preference for the rising sign in the election would be the sign that's on the first, the tenth, or the ninth in the natal chart, right? And if I can't get that, then my second choice is this trine or sextile of these, right? And my third choice is this. You know what I mean? And that's well, that what would I make sense. Do. And rather than just kind of riffing, and that's what that's what mm-hmm. I get the sense here is, oh, Jupiter's to his radical place. I'm like, get out of here. Because if you're starting to look at that, I mean, if you look through everything you mentioned as rules, you've got 15, 20 different possibilities of stuff, right? And you've got to your natal place, trying to your natal place, to the uh, Jupiter trying to Venus's natal place. You know what I mean? You just, you probably have 70 or 80 different possibilities there. That's too many, right? That's not, that's not really real. And that's not ranking it in terms of, of the, of the, what factor is important. You know, like for example, when I do a, a fixed star talisman, I prefer to have the moon applying to conjoin the fixed star. Mm-hmm. But you can take the sextile or trine as, a, as, a, as, as also too, but it's better to have the applying conjunction in my view, right? I mean, you can still do so. So that's, that's what I don't see in this is there's no ranking. There's no sense of what's really important or whatever. So, um, and also I'm just like, frankly, from a practical standpoint, I'm like, I just don't need it. You know what I mean? It's just like it adds this whole different level of complexity into doing the elections. And I was like, oh my God, I'll, it just, it would drive me nuts. I think as a practical matter to try to be doing that stuff. But that's what I would say with this is if you're serious about it, what we need to do is to go into this and really start to systematize it, right? And make sure it's workable in the sense of not having too many factors and also having those factors ranked, you know, and it would matter for every election, we need to figure that out too. You need to figure out what the relationship for the natal. But I think it's really what I like about it. And I don't want to get to, cause it's so easy to rag on stuff, but what I love about Gadbury is that he's really given us a, a something to work with that you do not get with anybody else. Right. I mean, they'll say, like Ramsey says, you got to use the natal chart and how uh, doesn't give at least, yeah. <laughs> at least Gadbury is saying, look, this is a possibility. So I'd say, yeah, if you're interested in that, you t- but you got to run with that. I mean, you basically, if you do the natal based, you have to figure, well, my elections are going to be a little sucky. The actual electional chart is not going to be that great. I mean, what I've done is I've expended my effort on making sure that I'm aligned with the natal chart. And I've sh- basically, that's all I'm going to be able to do. You know, you're not going to be able to have the world's greatest electional chart that also relates to the natal. I mean, that's just, you just, something's got to give. So that you just have to make the choice. And I, I can't say for my, for me, I said, I'll go with the electional. I'm not going to worry about natal factors, but it would be perfectly reasonable to say, I'm just going to go with natal factors, but you just have to recognize that that's the reality. If you do go with that, then you're not going to be able to have, because you can't go to the client and just say, because it's easy as an armchair person, or you just posting like, okay, yeah, the next 50 years. Okay, fine. You know? Or it's like, you can have your wedding at 3 a.m. on, you know, Sunday, 2035. I mean, that's just not, it's not going to be, you're not going to do that as a, as a professional astrologer. You can do it as an armchair astrologer. And if you want to talk about how cool you are and how everyone else sucks, you can do it that way. But to do it, if you're actually going to use these elections, there's either for yourself or somebody else, you're going to need to be more practical, which means you have to cut down the factors. You you really need to focus on say three, four, five factors. And that's about all you can get in a chart. And, um, but I think it's, it's really interesting. And that's, like I said, why Gadbury is really front and center, like in my electional course, in the Renaissance Astrology Electional Compilation that has all the sources in it, because I'm like, oh my God, finally, we've actually got a glimpse into how you could actually do it. And um, so I, I think it's a great, it was a great choice for the, for this electional, you know, the um, discussion. Oh yeah. And I, and honestly, I, I don't see a whole lot of difference um, between the, the second one, which is, I guess what we'll get into now, mm-hmm. which is to base an election on a horary. Because again, you're going to focus it very much on what that whole area is. But no, conceptually, no. it's a trip, right? Oh, yeah. And I think that's no, totally. what's really interesting about it is that, because first of all, again, for modern people, the natal chart is the be all and end all. I mean, it's me, right? And I'm the center of the universe, right? So obviously, it must be important because it's all about me. Um, and But the modern view of astrology is something to the fact that the planets are beaming out some kind of energy or something like that. And I suppose at the time of your birth, it's at an angle. And so it hits you a certain way. And that's the thing. And when they transit, they're putting out the beams and bleh, some, something. We're yeah. not going to worry about that too much because that's confusing to me. But it has something to do with string theory or, you know, sunspots. <laughs> quantum. It's all quantum, quantum. Quantum mechanics, whatever. Synchronicity. So... <laughs> 
that's okay with natal. I mean, that's sort of, you can sort of make, get that concept of energetic causality or whatever. Horary, everything blows up with that. Because what the, f- I mean, how is the time of the question give you the answer, right? How does that work from the beams? You know, what's, what's going on in there? What, that's just, that, just, that just blows, everyone's brain kind of explodes with that. It makes sense if you think about the fact that everything from a hermetic standpoint, though, because everything comes from the one, everything is connected by these chains of spiritual sympathy and correspondence. Nothing happens out of order, right? So the time of your question and then the asking of the astrologer is all in tune with the planets and the cycles and everything like that. And so these underlying cycles are reflected from the, in the planets. And really what we're dealing with these underlying spiritual cycles, whether it's your birth, whether it's an election, whether it's a horary, they're all connected in that web of spiritual uh, correspondence and sympathy. And that's the, that makes sense. That's their traditional view, right? Now you do have the Ptolemy with the heat and stuff, and you do have beams from Alkindi and everything like that. But nevertheless, there's still the traditional view is that everything fits together. Everything's a part of an underlying pattern. And when we read the pattern of the stars, we can see the underlying patterns that reflects. And so the fact of using a horary as the basis of your election is really kind of mind blowing when you think about it, because it it fits. And one of the things I really like to do, for example, I have a reading called a complete relationship reading, which does, if someone, you know, will I marry X or whatever? So they do a horary, will I marry X? But then I'll compare the natal charts. And so what's really interesting about that is it's pretty much almost always looking at the same kind of underlying patterning from different perspectives. And the horary will say, yes, you're going to get married or no, you're not. And then you look at the natal chart and you can see the people's emotional or psychological interactions, right? And that's really interesting too. Now that by itself doesn't tell you whether they're going to have a relationship, but it's really interesting to see that. So that's what I like about it is that, you know, really what the horary reveals to us is that everything fits, everything's part of a pattern, right? And that, that makes sense that we can go ahead and, and do that, the, the lectional off the horary if you step from that standpoint. But it's still kind of mind blowing. If, if you look at what Gadbury did, essentially it's sort of like, a remediation because he looks at the horary and it's not a good horary. It's not oh, no. very good it, for the ship. It's awful. It is. Yeah. It's not good at all for the ship. And so he says, okay, what can we do to kind of make that better? And then he says, you know, the ship, it at least didn't sink. It didn't do that well, but at least didn't sink. You know, it wasn't as dire. And that's what I really like about that too. Cause that seems to me a very realistic understanding of how to work with electional, you know, and even with talismans right? Is that because people say to me like, well, can I overthrow my whole chart with a talisman? Also elections are the same way. The people are sort of astrologers that are afraid of magic or something. They don't want to do, do talismans. The election is kind of magical for them. And like, they're sort of of the opinion that if I get the right election, I can be president of the United States or I can be a billionaire, right? And you're going to do that for me. And, and if I pay you, you know, the whatever, 60 bucks, you're going to make me a billionaire, right? Because you're going to get the right time. And, and that's why I have to be very worried about the election and have to be freaking out about it. Because if it's done right, you know, I have godlike power. And if there's one thing wrong with it, like Pluto in the third house, oh my God, then, you know, obviously my head's going to explode and it, it won't work. It's like, that's just not, elections are just a small, you know, cycle of fate, right? You've got your sort of natal chart, and you've got all the transits and whatever, Fedari and everything that are going on. You've got the horary stuff, you've got electional. So that's a small, but you might as well pick those as the best you can, right? And then you can do, you can ameliorate things is what I would say about it. And I think that's what's nice about this. It's not worthless to do elections. Everything's not necessarily written in stone that you're, you're, you're devastated by the horary. At the same time, you can't over, entirely overturn it. I mean, that this, this election didn't turn this into the totally f- fabulous voyage of the you know, with making huge profits or anything like that. You just didn't sink. So I think that that's, that I think conceptually, I think essentially, as I read it, he's doing even less. I was in some notes here. It said, he said, um, for the horary based election, he said, make the ascendant and the moon of the election, the 10th and the horary was the, basically the one thing he said in terms of the rules. And then he essentially, I think, did a similar sort of thing, which is to look at the, the, the horary chart and see the certain points, the signs, and then to to duplicate those into the, to the, to the uh, election, you know? So the, the other thing I really like about basing it on the horary, the way he did is the horary gets you so much more detail than like natal because you're, you're able to pull all that stuff, that situation 
into what's going on. And then he was able to kind of, and he might've been doing this after the fact where he's able to kind of predict how it would, how it would mitigate that. Like it, it can't completely erase it, but in my day job is it security. So I'm all about mitigation. I can't prevent people from attacking us, but I can make it less bad when they attack us and I can make them less likely to succeed in their attacks. And this, this kind of approach strikes me as very much like that, just to echo everything that you've been saying. So like in the beginning, he, he you have the whole area of if the intended voyage will be profitable and it, it seems like a pretty strong, uh, don't do this voyage. And then the, no, no, I have to do the voyage because I've already secured the, the funding for the voyage. Um, and that, that looks like a, a problem. And then he has to address that, which is interesting. Yeah, I think that's like, um, you know, the key being understanding that that's what you're doing is mitigation. But yeah, I think you can do it. You can go ahead and focus. Um, let me take a look at the at that again, as far as the, yeah. I mean, the main thing that he does is to take the 10th house in the moon, because the moon is at um, about 15 or 16 Libra and about 20 Libras on the 10th. And then make that the ascendant in the in the in the um, electional chart. Um, and so then, what that means is that the ruler of the ascendant is Venus, who's in um, uh, Cancer, which is triplicity dignity. So that's nice. And then Venus is unafflicted, so that's nice. Um, and also in the not in she's actually in the ninth, but kind of widely conjunct the tenth. And then the um, ninth ruler is dignified by term, which is not bad and unafflicted. So th that's not bad. You know what I mean? If you're just looking at those factors, I mean, that's what I would say about it just as an electional chart, you know, without looking at the, the corresponding stuff. So we, what, what he does is to pick up the factor, you know, some nice factors from the, the horary and then put those into the, you know, basically the moon and the ascendant, put that into that and then make it, and then, then come up with a chart that's not really not that, that's not not so bad. It's got some, you know, reasonable dignity. I mean, I wouldn't say this is such a terrible, just if I was looking at elections, right? I would say this is not, not, a, not a spectacular chart, but not bad. I mean, probably for an electional, for this, I would want to have more connection between the, the ninth, you know, the, the, the moon and the ruler of the ninth, you know, or the, or the ruler of the ascendant in the ninth. That would be nice to have, but even just getting, you know, when I'm doing like a, a trip, you know, someone says I want to take a trip. You just want to make sure that the first and the moon and the ninth are unafflicted. And if you can get that, you're doing well. And if you can connect those, that's sort of my methodology would be to connect those two and be like, Hey, you're doing really well. So I, th I think what he's done is done a pretty good election. And then also managed to get some nice, you know, some factors from that horror into the, into the election. I mean, you've got the south node is like within five degrees of the ascendant. So that's not so great. I mean, there's, you could go through this and go, I don't like this. I don't like that. Now, one of the things yeah. he, did, he did do that I like about this is he's got spike arising too. And you got uh, moon's conjunct, moon is actually conjunct Arcturus. But um, so that's nice. Spike arising is nice. I mean, that's, that's a nice factor to have in the chart. So um, I think it's really more the conceptual idea basing it on horary, I think that's what's going to, that really, I think trips people out. You know what I mean? And um, it's, it's, it's one thing to say natal, but when you go say horary, that's, I think, really interesting. And I think you're also, it would be interesting to go through and to deliberately, I mean, because here's what happens to me. People will come to me and they'll say, particularly relationships, they'll be like, well, I marry X. And I'm like, no. And they just go ahead and do it anyway. And I, I'm to the point now where I'll say to those clients, I said, you know, they say, what do I do? I say, well, look, I said, if it was a business, then maybe you wouldn't do it. But I said, since it's a relationship, you're just going to go ahead and try anyway. Just keep it in the back of your mind that, you know, this astrologer told you it might not work out. But it never deterred anybody from going forward with it. But it would be interesting to go ahead and like, or if you did it for yourself with horaries, to go ahead and try to do elections and see what the results were in terms of trying to, to do some mitigation of it. Um, well, to be honest, I, I really would want to do that, but I don't do horaries for myself. So it just had to be a bunch of inception, uh, inception charts. And that's that's not quite the same thing um, as as a true horary chart. The, well, the think, inception taking the time of a thing and doing yeah, that. I think my clients are very brave because <laughs> a horary is like going to the oracle, you know. Oh yeah. And you could get you can you know they'll you know I'll tell you what I think is going to happen based on the chart, and that's really heavy, you know. And there's a lot of situations where I don't want to know the answer, you know. I'm I'm happy just to kind of let it go. 
So I do, th I understand where you're coming from with that. And, um, the, um, but that's what I would say. What, what, what's cool about it is that we have this incredible tradition that's been passed on to us and we've got sort of these areas that you can work at if you're interested. If somebody really got taken with this, they could start doing it. And, um, what it'd be interesting to do though is, and this is what I would encourage people to do is to say, have a methodology, right? And, and don't just be doing the, it's just, and even Gadbury's doing is just sort of riffing, right? Like, oh yeah, look at this, uh, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, except you didn't say that as your rules. I mean, you look at the chart and you got something that wasn't even mentioned in your, in your, in your methodology. So it's like, that's, you don't find that with me. I mean, you don't find that in my course where I'm like giving, you know what I'm saying? You, you find them pretty yeah. methodical about these are the factors and here you can see them in the chart. And um, that's, you know, I think it's a good thing to start with. If you want to be a little more, you know, riffing, that's fine. But it, when it's all riffing, it just gets to be a little problematic. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't, I just don't get the sense of having a rigorous methodology here, as opposed to just sort of this loose kind of thing of like, well, I've got about 50 possible things and then I'll just throw up charts and okay, I'm, look at these, there's the, you know, there it is in the chart. That doesn't seem to me to be very rigorous. Um, but nevertheless, I think this has a real potential in terms of giving you, you know, a, a lot of interesting possibilities that you could work with with this and 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 do it. Um, but have a, have the factors first and the chart as a result of those, as opposed to having the ch chart first and then having the factors that you come up with as just coming from the chart, you know, whatever random charts you happen to be looking at. That's the modern method, and I think that's a little bit reflected here in Gadbury. Oh yeah. And like the basing, I, I, I still think there's a lot of promise with the, the Horary approach. And I, I got the impression that that was really kind of Gadbury's go-to based on how much time he spent with it. And he talked about exactly what the Horary said and how things happened. And also when he, at the very end of the chapter, spoiler, um, he kind of goes in and he lists, you know, in, in the best, in the best uh, the best of these is the first, but then there's also the second, and then there's also the third. Um, but I, I don't think he did the first because he even talked about how it was impossible to know that most of the time anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that when you're talking about the 17th century is a lot of people wouldn't know their time of birth. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, some, I mean, if you were an important person, you would. it's, it's interesting because I've, I have uh, uh, clients who are from India or Indian ancestry. They 100% of the time know their time of birth because it's very important in their culture. So they always know it. Whereas, all, you know, it's not unusual to have people, particularly, I think in England, they don't have times on their birth certificate. So, you know, people are like, they don't know. And then I've had African clients who didn't even know what day they were born. And then other ones who didn't even know what year they were born. So that's interesting. Because again, it's not a cultural thing. It's not important in the culture necessary to have that. They maybe they don't have birthdays or whatever. But um so it just kind of depends on your, on your circumstances. And that's one of the great things about horary, obviously, is that anybody can ask a horary, right? You don't need to worry about, because people email me about rectification. That's another one. I'm like, eh, I mean, I don't do it. And I don't know anybody to recommend who can do it, but it, it does seem to me to be a little jury rigged. You know, it's a little bit hard to be, you're reverse engineering it, and then you're going to go back and predict. And it's, it's a little hard to do that. But it's just, if you don't have that, other people say, oh, I was born at 2 a.m. I'm like, well... That's also a little questionable, typically. I mean, if it's 307, you know, even then it might be sort of off. I mean, that's, that's one of those things, too, is like, you know, when exactly, you know, the, the, the doctor wrote down the time or whatever. It's like, the, you know, there could be some, a little bit of variation on that. So, again, you just got to recognize there's a little slippage with that stuff, with the, with the natal chart. But, um, yeah, I, like I said, the, the more I think about it, the more I think it would be fun to work with it. But I think, you know, it would be, like I said, I'd love to see somebody do it in a, in a rigorous way and then keep track of it, right? That would be the coolest thing would be just what Gadbury did was to be like, okay, hoary, electional results, you know, and do that about 50 times. And that would be interesting to see, you know, what the outcome was, you know, and after, I think after a while, you'd get, you'd develop a, a real individualized methodology that would be, you'd be very effective, you know, that, that resonates with you and that gives you results that you're happy with. So I, I think it's definitely something to be interesting to follow. And, um, but the third method of Gadbury is the one that I follow, which is you just do a good election. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, and he's interesting with it because he has a lot of explanation of why this is okay. He's like, well, it's, it's intuitively in tune or whatever. And I'm like, that can be true. But my sense of it is this, is that this is a good time, you know, 
And whether or not it necessarily 100% relates to your natal chart or not, it's still, this is a really good time to take a, this particular type of action. And, and so therefore that's what I, that's what I use for it. And it's like, you know, um, I just go and get the absolute best possible election I can get. And even that's not that easy. I mean, I was doing business elections during this, you know, couple, three months that we're in. It's like not easy. I mean, there were some of them. I mean, one of the, my favorite things to do is what I call the straddle. And so like you can do Jupiter and Mercury will set up this way. So you can have, they, they'll rule the 10th, the first and the second, which is nice for business because the business is good and you're good. Your money's good for the second and your marketing and your reputation of fame and all are all good. Use the same planet. So if say you have Mercury and Gemini or something, you line it up and then you're covering all your bases. Now that's a really typically short election. You end up with like an eight to 10 minute you know, time span. So that's not a lot of time, but that's one of my favorite ones to do. And that way, like if, like if it's dignified by sign, it's like out of control. I mean, great business, great money, great marketing, you know? And um, so I think that that's, but that's, you know, I mean, I was looking for elections and I couldn't find it. I mean, trying to get the first, the, t- the second and the 10th, right. And the moon unafflicted, good luck sometimes, you know? Uh, it's, it can be really hard to find that stuff going on. Yeah, I, I went ahead and brought up the the schema electionist, uh, which is the the one that the Gadbury's third one, uh, which which is the one that you like. And as said right now, the astrological weather is awful. So um, I have picked back up the electional course and I'm on the business election and the business election for the next 30 days is quite exciting. Um, trying to make that work. Yeah. Um, I'm like, uh, okay, yeah, this is going to be a Saturn business. That's what I'm doing. This is totally a Saturn business. I'm going to do agriculture or or something to deal with dead people. That's that. Or I think old you people. use it that's for anything. I mean, you got yeah. Saturn and Aquarius plus 10. That's yeah, great. No. That's just killing you. I mean, that's just insanely powerful. So even if you did something like, you know, Aquarius uh, on the, the Ascendant and the second house, right? Mm-hmm. You got your guy killer. Okay. So, and maybe you're, you've got pair, maybe you have a peregrine tenth ruler, right? So, okay. Your marketing and your reputation is not that great, but boy, it's a great business that makes a huge, a lot of money. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. if it's, if you got to do it in the next 30 days, I mean, that's the thing is someone's like, I got to do it. You know, it's like, you don't, it's not like you can just sit back. It's funny. Cause I had a, a, a guy that I knew when I was in Washington, DC that liked to go on these internet groups and do horror stuff. Right. And when I told him, I said, you know what, when I get a client asking me a horror, I don't just get to decide whether I'm going to do it or not. I got to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, (laughs) he just sort of popped in when he felt like it, you know, it's like, it doesn't, if you're professional, it just doesn't work that way. You know, if someone comes to you and says, give me the best, I could say, here's what I can do for you. I can give you the best time. It won't necessarily be good, but I can definitely give you the best time over the next 30 days or whatever, any time period you give me, if it's, if it's tomorrow, for two hours, I can tell you when the best time is, right? It's just not going to be that great. I mean, that's the yeah, reality yeah. of it is that, but there's a lot of benefit in not having the terrible stuff. You know what I mean? There's all sorts of really awful elections out there. So if you can get something that's halfway reasonable, you know, but that's not typically what the client wants. The client wants the best election of the century. It's like, oh, this is not necessarily possible within that time frame. So that's why my electional, when I do it, when I, someone orders one or someone asks me about it, I've got like a huge chunk of giant paragraph disclaimer in mind, because I think electional is probably the most, has the highest level of dissatisfaction with customers because what they would like to do is I will give you an election and they'll look at it and say, no, that sucks. Give me another one. Like, no, that sucks. Give me another one. So they, I'd be there for like 15 or 16 hours feeding them stuff until they're happy about it. And if they're not happy, then they get a refund. You know what I mean? And it's like, and for their, so I basically operate under their methodology or whatever lack of methodology. And it's like, that's just not possible. What I have to do is say, look, I'm going to give this to you. You don't have to use it, but you can't, I'm not going to do another one for you just because you don't like the astrology. You go back and look at the astrology and you don't like it. And, um, and I'll just tell people that people come and say, well, you know, obviously we can't do it because Mercury's retrograde and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, look, you don't get to choose the factors, right? You can choose that if you need to be nine to five, I can handle that. You can tell me the, the date range and the time range, but you don't get to choose the factors. You're going to have to leave that up to me. And if, if you want to have specific factors in there or the specific factors you don't want in there, you don't want to have me do it, you know, because it's just impossible. It's like, like being a surgeon and having somebody reach in and say, oh, no, you need to cut this. 
Like I just can't operate that way, especially since they're coming from a whole different view of they're looking at a natal view. They're looking at the entire chart. What they think is important may not be important, that sort of stuff. So it's really electional, professionally doing elections. I have often thought I would just stop doing them. It's just like, there's just, it's, it's, it really can be problematic. And I, but I've gotten a lot better at screening people so that the customers and I are on the same page. Cause a lot of people are happy. You know, I mean, probably my favorite ones to do are business elections because business elections, you know, typically you can go online. So it will be like 24 seven, you know, and that's really great. And um, whereas in the, you know, previously, like for the business, people wanted to do the incorporation and they would want to go in in person to the office, you know, the state office to do it and that you couldn't control it. And it's during a certain time period. Those were, those are more difficult to do, but, or weddings. I used to do a lot of weddings. I don't do hardly any weddings now. And I'm glad because it happened okay, in May on a weekend between two and five o'clock. I'm like, oh God, you know, it's just really had a very limited, you know, time frame. And then people are like, oh, the caterer can't come that weekend. Could you do it over again? It's like, well, no, I don't do it over again. But, you know, it was just with a business one, people could control it, you know, or anything you can just drop in the mailbox. That's another one too. Just go and put it in the mailbox. Boom. That's great. And you can really control that. So that's what, that's the thing it's about elections is that. They're, they're hard to do. And then you often have, if the, like I said, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. So people look at it and they'll just be like kind of appalled that this horrible stinking thing that you've given to them as an election. And it's like, except that's from your perspective and you're not really looking at from the reality of like, okay, it, it had to be next week and it had to be from nine to five. And right now, like you said, the astrological weather is just abysmal. So it's not a whole lot you can do with it. I think people are the impression that I can like move the heavens around or something, or that I, it's my fault, you know, like, well, give me a good election. Like, I mean, all I can do is look for it, right. I can just see what's out there, you know, and I'm not able to control what, you know, what's coming up. It's going to be frustrating too, because you'll have, it's funny. Cause you'll be like, okay, I'm forward, backwards, forward. Okay. We're almost there. You know, Saturn's just gone into this and this has gone here and then you move it a day and it throws everything off or there'll be something will get in the way that can be frustrating the other thing that'll happen is what i love is occasionally everything just like boom falls together and you have this incredibly brilliant election that just falls into your lap and that's kind of i like the synchronicity of that too so it just it just sort of depends on you know what what your what the circumstances are but like i said my philosophy is i like gadbury's third method and his third method is to say, get a really good election. And so that's what I do. And I'll have, you know, I, as you can see, when I was thinking about that, I'll go through and, and look at the, what I think the key factors are, you know, and I try not to have more than four, say three, four or five factors. And I'll do is do the best I can. So for so example, we're talking about the business election. You know, I want to, I like to have the first, the second and the 10th houses. So the rulers of those houses and the moon, and then those houses unafflicted, right? And if possible, it'd be nice to connect them. I mean, I wouldn't re require that, but it'd be cool to have like the rule of the second making an applying trine, right? To the rule of the first or have the rule of the first in the 10th, right? I mean, those are, it's nice to even have that additional connection. It's particularly nice to have that kind of stuff if you're doing like a, a house sale, right? But w one of the things you find out is like, for example, the first ruler and the seventh, there's only a limited number of planets that can do that. So if you have first and seventh, the only possible pairs are, Moon, Saturn, Sun, Saturn, Venus and Mars and Mercury and Jupiter, right? And so it's very easy, like right now, to get in a situation where all those planets, one of those, one of those pairs and all that planets is afflicted. So you're going to try to do something with first and seventh, like a business, you know, like a sale or a marriage or something. You just got a, a heck of a time setting those up. So think about that. Then you want to get natal factors in. Hmm. Good luck. Yeah, that, that's that's a bit much. Yeah. And what, what did Gadbury say were were good things for an election um, for the for the third method? The third what, method what that he was mostly looking what for. Was he looking at because he goes a lot about justifying why I think this is an okay way of doing it. Um, what did he say here? Um, just looking at it. Yeah, yeah. He says, look at the Lord of the Ascendant, which you know, we're doing the chip chart again. So Lord of the Ascendant and the Moon, right? It says the moon is, um, so let's take a look at that chart. That's the, let me just take a look at that one. Okay, so this is actually an interesting chart. So we got Cancer rising, right? So the moon is the ruler of the, of the uh, ascendant and the moon is uh, peregrine, but in the 10th in the, uh, house, conjunct the 10th the cusp. Um, Jupiter is rising and exalted, but 
I don't think you know, Gadbury didn't say it's retrograde. So that's a little bit problematic. So right off the bat, I'm not sure I would want to have a retrograde, even if it's exalted. I don't think I want to have a retrograde planet rising in my chart. Um, he does talk about the ruler of the ninth. He says Saturn, who's not so great, except look at Saturn's in Aquarius. So Saturn's really nicely dignified. Um, and, and the ruler of the ninth in the ninth. So, I mean, perfectly logical factors. And, and I think this is like, I mean, see, I would have said, okay, I want to have the moon dignified, right? And I don't think I want to have a retrograde planet rising. But otherwise, I like, I like Saturn, ruler of the ninth, well dignified. And um, the moon also does trine uh, that Jupiter there. So that's nice too. Now, the other problem with the moon is the moon is applying to square of Mercury. So that I probably would have. So I don't think I would have probably chosen this as my election for the ship. You know, since I have no other factors and all I have to do is the election, there's enough stuff in there that I would have said, you know, you've got, because I always said first ruler, um, first house, moon, and the ninth ruler and the ninth house would be one of the ones I would have focused on. Any of those, the moon is applying to a square of, of Mercury. So I would have said, no, I don't think I would have taken that as an election. So. Well, at, at the risk of completely trying to bullshit my way through this, um, would a retrograde would a retrograde Jupiter make sense because you want the ship to be returning? Would would that make sense? You could possibly or would it, do would that, but I think that I would have to look again because, like Ramsey is the one I use for ship, you know, for journeys. And mm -hmm. um, let me see what he says about that. Hold on a second. Ooh. I mean, it's not, he, the thing, what I think it's interesting is that, that Gadbert didn't say that in the chart, right? If he'd said, right. look, it's fine. I would have been like, okay, I see where you're coming from. But I'm like, I think he probably didn't notice it or like, it, cause it doesn't have the R symbol on there, you know, the retrograde symbols. So let me just take a look at this. Ramsey is what I actually use for almost everything for electional as my main, as my, one of my key sources, um, his um, astrology restored or astrologia restaurata yeah revolution he says you can't do without the revolution i don't see retrograde i'd have to go through read this because there's like this is like four pages of really fine stuff but I mean, you could do that i think that i'm a little bit retrograde is an affliction generally and so i just be nervous about doing that um because that might be you never even get there in the first place you know, oh, yeah. with a retrograde planet on the ascendant, you could be like, you never even get out the door, you know, it's just too much delay or you just decide, you know, you know what I mean? It's, so, um, but, you know, in a horary, when you have the, when you have the thing that you're looking for retrograde, that's an indication of recovery. So, yeah, I mean, it's like, you could do that. I, I have a little, um, that's be very much a personal preference in terms of whether you wanted to do that or not. But I, I suspect he didn't notice it. He didn't realize it was a retrograde because otherwise I think he would have said something about it and he would have put the, the retrograde symbol on there. Um, but, um, but you know, what's funny about this is that it plays into the whole standard approach to election, which is to start picking at it, you know? And I think that that's, you know, when I look at this one, I'm like, this is fine. You know, I really like it. It's not exactly the methodology that I would have used, but that's like, I don't like chocolate. I like vanilla kind of thing, you know, and I can't look at this and say any of these elections, you know, when I, when you look through Gud Gadbury's rationale for it, I think he does a pretty good job of following through on it. And it's okay. I mean, like I said, I would tend to be a little more rigorous with it, but that's just my personal preference. And whether I would have followed it or not, I don't look at this and say, Oh, this is a disaster or anything like that. I'm like, oh, this is a really interesting and I think it's brave to do it too. It's, it's interesting. We had this um, podcast with the um, astrological panel, astrological magicians. And one of them, I mean, there's two of us that are actually professionals. And um, one guy was like, he's like, I don't even put the charts up anymore in my talismans because he was just getting so much, you know, people were just picking them to death. And um, so it takes a certain amount of bravery and here's Gadbury and he's like for hundreds of years, you know, he's got it out there. So I think it takes, it's, it's brave to do that, but I think it's very helpful too, because otherwise people can't see what you're doing. And that's what we say about Gadbury is that it's incredible that he did this. He did a great service for us because it allows us to look at it. So we need to have a little respect too and say, you know, this is, you know, I respect where he's coming from and it's maybe different from how I would have done it, but I think this is a viable approach. And, um, I certainly think that the factors that he's looking at are reasonable. And um, probably, like I said, if I was going to do a ship thing, I would be looking at Lily 
in the first house and then also look at Ramsey in the ninth house and probably synthesize that those you know, the rules out of there. But probably what I'd be looking at would be first, the moon obviously is going to be important in any traveling you know, or journey election, you know, because it's the fastest planet. It's a natural ruler of movement. And then also the ninth for any kind of long distance stuff. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, it gives us a good framework for working with these elections. And I think what's cool about it is I think that it's really giving um, the traditional, these are the traditional bases for elections, right? You're either going to Jason on a natal chart, you're going to do it on the horary, or as Gadbury says, it's explicitly, it's okay to do it just to have a really good election. And that's the, that's the methodology that I like to follow. Um, and I think any of them is a reasonable way to go about it. I think that these, it's really kind of exciting to be doing this now because we're getting to the point where there's, there's more and more people doing this, there's, there's interest in it. And so if you want to get in this in a serious and rigorous way, you have a lot of interesting opportunities to do that. And I think this is an area that would definitely, you know, is benefiting from, from diving in and actually saying, okay, how can I work with these? How can I work with this and produce a methodology? And then how can I go ahead and actually apply these, um, you know, this, this, this style and, and start doing elections? So I think it's a, it was a really great choice in terms of the of of uh, starting with Gadbury. Yeah, and I'm totally going to ask you one more question though. How how would you recommend somebody get started in this if this is something they want to start testing out and trying out? Where where would that starting place be? I recommend you take my course. I mean, really seriously, it's sort of like it's funny because you know, as an attorney, I don't have people saying to me like arguing with my briefs or something like that, or like saying, I don't know what I'm talking about. I think it's because they are like, oh, law is very complicated. You got to learn it. You got to have a license and everything. I could, I could, you know, I need, I need to study it. So I'll, you know, you know what you're talking about. But astrology, it's like people look at it for 15 minutes and think they can pick it up. And that's the problem is with, if you're going to do traditional astrology, because here's the question you're going to make is that I think there's a fundamental choice. It's like, am I going to be a modern astrologer that just does the usual modern thing, which is to pick up some various techniques and slot them into my modern practice, right? Um, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Or I'm going to be a traditional astrologer. If you're going to be a traditional astrologer, medieval Renaissance astrologer, you need to immerse yourself in the worldview and the philosophy and then the technique. You need to learn all these techniques because what you're going to do is if you're coming from a modern perspective and you start looking at this, you're going to immediately be, your automatic instincts are always to be go modern, Right. And you're going to come up with moderns and natal too. You're going to have a natal approach to it. And electional is very different from natal. Even Gadbury, you'll notice this. He's not looking at the whole chart. He's only looking at specific factors, right? Both in the natal chart, as far as what he's basing the chart, the election on, and then the electional chart. He's only doing, he's not saying, oh yeah, and look at, you know, the third, the third house or look at the, you know, the, the 12th house, you know, it's very focused. And that's one of the key differences between uh, natal and electional and horror is that natal, the whole chart is important. Horror and electional, we're focused. We have to be focused. You have to be focused in horror because you only want information about specific, a specific circumstance. It's going to be reflected in certain houses. And then in the electional, again, you're focused on certain things, but also because you're going to go crazy. I mean, you, you got, you cannot eliminate Pluto from the chart. You know, you can't, that afflicted Saturn's going to be somewhere, right? It's not going to totally disappear. So, you, you have to have a different focus. So really what you need to do is now it doesn't have to even be my course. I mean, there's plenty of, of people teaching traditional astrology out there that are great, but that's what I would say is that if you're really serious about doing this, you need to be grounded in the technique and, and the, and the methodology. And the, the easiest way to do that is to have a teacher because it would be really hard. I mean, I suppose you could buy, you could buy the books and you can have the PDFs on your hard drive. I mean, like a lot of, you know, there's a lot of people with books sitting on their shelves and PDFs on their hard drive. That's a long way from doing it. And if you just start getting it and whacking at it, you don't have the benefit of having the, 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 the intuition and the knowledge built up that you can. Cause what happens with me is when I do stuff, I'll say, I think it's like this. And then I'll see a source saying, yeah, it's like that. But I think what's interesting about my course is that, and this is what's one of the things about electional is that, how do you find them? I mean, that's the thing. Like horror, you got the chart. I mean, there you go. Okay, judge the chart. But the election's like, okay, well, how do I find this stuff? So that's one of my the things that came to me was like, okay, this idea of like, first you need the factors in the chart, right? So what are the factors that have to be in the chart? Okay. And then rank them in terms of the speed, in terms of the slowest to fastest changing, right? Now the ascendant's going to change every three minutes, right? And the sign's going to turn over every two hours, Right. So mm -hmm. that's super fast changing. But if you're talking about Saturn, 
I mean, he goes through a sign and it takes him 29 years to get to the Zodiac, right? So that'll give you the slowest changing factor. Then you say, okay, from March 1st to July 5th, right? That gives you your outer range. And then you start going to the next factor and then that gets you in, you know, so that was kind of my, you know, realization is that that gives you a methodology for finding stuff, but you, you have to start with having set factors. And so that's why I really think that the more I, I look at the way people do modern astrologers do it, even contemporary traditional astrologers. And you can see from Gadbury is that I think what's happening is that they have a loose methodology of possible things they could do. And really how they're doing the election is they're just looking at charts right? They just say, okay, let's start looking at charts and, oh, that looks nice. And, and then, so, oh, look at this, look at this, look at this, as opposed to, okay, first ruler, second ruler, 10th ruler, dignified, right? And, un, and unafflicted. Okay. Now wh where, where, what about those, you know, and that, that really gives you that methodology really gives you something to work with, you know, and that's what I think is the missing link here with Gadbury and it's certainly also something that's missing from, from what I see with a lot of contemporary practice, whether it's build as traditional or build as modern. And, um, but also what I would say is, I don't think you have to follow mine. I mean, you could do a lot of other different ways, but what I do think is important is that you have a methodology. You know, it's not exactly the contents of that methodology because there's lots of different ways you can do traditional, but if you don't have a methodology, then I don't think you have really have anything. I think you're sort of fooling yourself. And if you have customers, you're sort of fooling them too. And um, that's really, I think the key to it is to, to set that methodology and let the methodology guide the election as opposed to just random charts and, you know, random factors coming up. Oh, well, th thank you for that. And thank you for coming on this podcast, YouTube, whatever. Oh, it's great to be here. And it's like, um, I think that this, this is, it's interesting because I do a number of these. This is a much more technical focused, you know, we're looking at charts, we're talking about Gadbury, we're going to throw all the details of it. So that was really interesting to do that. And I'm glad to have that focus. Um, there's all, all, so many different approaches and it was really nice to have that kind of, you know, real serious approach to it. Because I think you take it seriously. That's the thing I, I get this vibe from you <laughs> that, that you're going to, you know, this is something you take real seriously and that you're really rigorous about it. And I think that's what's really special about, you know, as we move into the 21st century is that we're getting to the point where we're getting really high caliber of people doing it. And that's certainly like, I sort of felt like I was a voice crying in the wilderness for a while. And now I don't have that feeling so much anymore. I feel like people are like, even if we don't have exactly the same approach, that people want to have rigor. And I think that that's what mm -hmm. I really think is clear about the work that you do is that you take it very seriously and that you're very rigorous in, in your approach. So I think I just think that's great. Thank you for that.